listening to The Writing Life, interviewing real writers about making a living from their words. Hi, we are The Writing Life, and we are here today with Timothy Jarvis, whose first novel, The Wanderer, is from the genre of weird fiction. So, hi, Tim. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. That's great. Well, so your first novel, The Wanderer, happens in London, and you have lived in the city for many years. Do you think it has also shaped you as a writer? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, I first moved to London immediately after I'd sort of finished my um, university studies, and I, I found it a really overwhelming place. And I was at, at the same time, I was just starting to write, so actually kind of getting used to London and becoming a Londoner went hand in hand with, with my writing. So most of my writing, most of my fiction is set in London. It evolves from the place um, and the spaces of the city are, are really important to me. I think all kind of cities, you know, internationally, especially uh, big cities, you know, storied cities like London are really inspirational to writers. They have, a, you know, so much history. But there's something particular about London that kind of ties in with my work, which is it's it's never been kind of built to a plan. It's always sort of haphazard. It's almost grown kind of organically. Um, and even when there was a chance to kind of impose a plan, a rational kind of enlightenment, reasonable plan on the city when it was rebuilt after the Great Fire, what actually happened was the, the sort of street plan of the old Gothic city was retained because the people whose properties had been burned insisted that although the buildings were going to be new, that, that you know, that street layout remained. So... You know, that's why Soho and those central areas have this this really sort of chaotic street plan, I think. So London is kind of, I think of it like as, it's kind of like a mind. It's got a rational kind of modern overlay, but underneath that rational modern overlay, there's a kind of an unconscious that goes back to the Gothic. So since my genre of fiction is really informed by Gothic fictions, I think London has a really plays a really important part in forming, in forming the way that I, I think about my work. So imagine, for example, you are suffering this terrible, terrible thing called the writer's block. <laughs> Is there any place in London where you would go to recover your inspiration? Yeah, I mean, I find it, I think for some, you know, for some writers, the most uh, kind of inspirational scene might be, you know, kind of a scene of uh, tranquility or, or rural life. But for me, it's always busy urban life. And I live quite centrally, so I can look out of my window and see, you know, kind of London passing by. But there are a few places that are have a sort of sig real significance. Um, where I live currently, I live in, in Stoke Newington. I live near a, a really strange and dilapidated and quite well-known cemetery called Abney Park. So sometimes I feel like that place is a space that gives me kind of inspiration, particularly for the Gothic elements. But I also really like seeing London from kind of on high. So probably my favourite place to look down on London from is Parliament Hill Fields in Hampstead Heath. Mm. And that's, it's, it's, I think, sort of seeing the city from on high and, and seeing those paths that people take and the way that, you know, kind of the way that people move through a city is almost like telling stories um, itself. And I find that really inspirational. So your work seems to fit into the genre of weird fiction, as Ines mentioned before. Would you be able to explain to our listeners and to me what exactly that genre is about and why you love it so much? Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. It's it's quite it's quite contested weird fiction as a genre. One of the things that I find really interesting about it is, unlike some of the other kind of genres that have become quite, you know, static or um, ossified in a way. Weird fiction is, is, you know, it's very, its borders are very porous, it's very permeable. So it allows you to do lots of different things within that mode. You know, there are lots of definitions of it. There's a kind of core definition of weird fiction, which comes from an early 20th century kind of post, a kind of secular post um, First World War kind of ghost storytelling. Um, there is weird fiction earlier than that, and it continues, but this is the kind of golden period of it. And it's defined by H.P. Lovecraft, the American horror writer, in a number of kind of critical essays that he wrote. And he points to a number of writers that have inspired him as being part of a kind of canon of weird fiction. So there is this kind of core weird fiction, and, and the core definition is really, it's a kind of post-19th century Gothic 
horror fiction where the supernatural elements don't come from the, the kind of revenants of the dead. It doesn't come from things coming back that have been suppressed um, as it is in the Gothic, in the in conventional Gothic. It's to do with things coming from weird outer spaces. In Lovecraft's work, these are kind of alien entities who've come from the, you know, the far reaches of the, the universe and they, they come to Earth and they, to them, mankind is completely insignificant. So one of the key features of weird fiction is that human beings are completely insignificant in the pattern of the universe. And for that reason, a lot of contemporary philosophers and critical theorists have taken up weird fiction as being a kind of parallel pulp kind of modernism, like parallel to the modernism um, you know, the, the high art modernism we know of Virginia Woolf and um, uh, James Joyce and Samuel Beckett, a kind of low culture modernism that, that sort of has the same kind of intellectual message in a way about the way that the humankind is being alienated by the conditions of modern life. But it does become more sort of general as well. And um, there was a, an anthology, I think about four years ago, which was produced by Anne and Jeff van der Meer, who, Jeff van der Meer is kind of a well-known writer of, of science fiction and weird fiction, and um, Anne van der Meer, his wife, who's a very well-known editor um, of speculative fiction, and they produced an anthology called The Weird, and in that anthology they were much more inclusive, which I thought was really an interesting thing, so they moved away from that kind of core genre of the cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft and moved out and, and incorporated a number of different things. So. Yeah, so I think, sorry, that's a bit of a long-winded explanation, but weird fiction is both this kind of core genre, which has kind of got this interest because it's about the, the insignificance of humankind, but it's also, in a sense, it's what's weird in fiction. So I would call it less a genre and more a mode, rather like comedy might be a mode that could fit into a number of different genres. Weird can fit into a number of different genres, and it's just about sort of weirding the, this thing and, and being porous with boundaries and you know just generally this kind of sense of the bizarre which which has really appealed to me mm, fantastic explanation thank you very much um you've mentioned a couple as you were speaking then but who would you say have been the the biggest inspirations for you uh, other writers who are writing weird fiction i think so going back when i was writing my novel the kind of form of it was coming from two specific novels actually um of the the gothic and the 19th century so the first is an irish gothic novel which is um often thought of as being the last of the original gothic and that's melmoth the wanderer by charles robert maturin and that's the the novel that i refer to in the title of my book um and it's a really strange novel about um, some kind of Faustian pact where somebody's had a diabolically extended lifespan and in their life, the, you know, in order to kind of repay the satanic figure for their kind of longevity, they have to uh, corrupt as many people as they can. And they go through this kind of really weird multiple storylines trying to corrupt various people who are in very bad situations. And they don't actually, they fail. The diabolical figure of Melm of the Wanderer actually fails to corrupt anyone. It's just really, it's a strange, very strange book. And it's more about the kind of complexity of the, of the narrative. So what, the, what Matrian was doing was like writing this late Gothic horror novel. But what he was really, I think, really liked the fiction of, of 70 years previously. So he was actually kind of writing a horror version of um, Tristram Shandy. <laughs> um, horror version of that kind of uh, kind of enlightenment strain. So it's a really it's a really interesting novel. So that kind of weird structure really informed the way I was thinking about writing when I was writing my novel. And the other novel is the one novel that Edgar Allan Poe wrote, which is called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, which is an amazing book and and kind of less and less well known and less well read than Poe's tales, which are obviously incredibly well known. Partly because Poe himself didn't really like it, I don't think. He he wrote it to make money explicitly, and he felt it didn't have that kind of cohesion and the the very powerful atmosphere that his best short fiction does. But I really like it for that reason. It's got it's got like moments of comedy that jar against moments of really heightened, beautiful, romantic, sublime writing that jar against moments of really kind of pulpy horror. So it's got this sort of weird tone that just shifts and unsettles you the whole way through so yeah so those books and that whole idea of rather than going for a kind of 
sustained, powerful tone going for something that's like really jarring and mixes comedy and and the romantic sublime and horror all in this kind of melting pot is really interesting to me. So those are the kind of the two sort of books I was thinking of, you know, from from the 19th century as real precursors. And then then there was a lot of um, a lot of authors that have influenced me doing, you know, on the fringes of speculative fiction that I was really, um, that, I, that I read and then kind of informed my work. Angela Carter has always been a really important writer for me. And um, the particular novel that I, probably my favourite book of hers is um, The Infernal Desire Machines of Dr. Hoffman. And that kind of weird sardian picaresque with lots of strange comedy and then sort of really grotesque bits and a kind of theoretical like um structure to it that's really odd was really important to me as well that thinking about how you could you could have this kind of picaresque and tell these different stories um and be quite jarring and strange and then two um more recent novels that are really important to the kind of um, the found manuscript element of my novel were The House of Leaves um, by Mark Z. Danilovsky, which I read when it came out and remember, you know, being kind of almost harrowed by this book because it's so, it's so strange. And it, the sense that the, you're, that the book is drawing you in and like it's seeping mm. off the page and like contaminating your own space um, was something I wanted to try and aim for in a way. And another book that's very similar, although in a totally different mode, because obviously the House of Leeds has that really strange, ergodic kind of um, formal experimental kind of element to it. But um, a really, and this book's experimental as well and in a slightly different way, but um, a book by an American writer called Caitlin R. Kiernan, um, which is called The Red Tree. And it's about it's about a writer who whose relationship breaks up and she goes um to a secluded house to to write a book and she discovers in the basement of the house the journal of the, the house's previous occupant and the house's previous occupant seems to have disappeared or, or died under mysterious circumstances and there's an obsession in his journal with a with a tree that grows near the house and it's a really extraordinary book with this kind of like really unsettling undercurrent to it there's one bit where the writer tries to go and find the tree that she she can see it from the from her house um that she's staying in and she estimates it's like five minutes walk and she tries to go and and walk to this tree and she ends up having this like several hour long kind of really harrowing sort of journey before having to give up and come back so that kind of you know that kind of playing with space and playing with what's real you know establishing something as real and then undercutting it like quite dramatically in this unsettling way and then trying to cause the book to kind of seep off the page and contaminate the space of the reader so those are things that you know I find really interesting um, and want you know those books were were kind of models for me. So why do you find the strange so inspiring? Is the weird something that has been always pres present in your writing? I think so. I've always um, written on the bizarre side. I, I started off, I didn't write that much when I was a teenager. So I, I actually started writing when I did a creative writing module at university in my sort of final year of undergraduate. And the first stories I wrote, I was, I was really reading a lot of Jorge Luis Borges at the time. And um, the first stories I wrote were kind of trying to ape this, you know, kind of uh, those amazing, like strange tales of Borges. So I think I, would, I started off like the writing that I was coming out of was was on that side, that strange side. And the more I've kind of written, the more I've thought about it, I feel that writing this sort of weird fiction allows me to articulate something that I wouldn't, that I want to be able to express that. And I don't feel many other modes would offer me personally that way of expressing it. So I think there's that thing of the the fantastic generally being that kind of undercurrent and um, the, the sort of in a way, realist fiction is kind of tied to the Enlightenment and to to, to rational thinking, and um, particularly the realist novel as a mode that kind of comes into being most, you know, strongly at that time. Um, and the Gothic and the things that descend from the Gothic seem to me to be kind of, I think John Klutz called it the bad conscience of, of that fiction. But I think that's a really, you know, that kind of idea of the Gothic and the fantastic that comes out of the Gothic as being this kind of, the flip side or, or the obverse of 
of real life, of reason, but for that reason, offering a, a way to articulate something about life that realism doesn't have, doesn't, isn't capable of articulating. So going to the very foundations of your writing, the initial spark or moment of inspiration, is that something that comes from inside or is it sparked by something you see or witness outside yourself? It mostly comes from from things that are that I see and kind of things that I see that sort of strike me as slightly strange and then um, get sort of transmuted when I think about them. So kind of my general process is to kind of go um, to just spend some time not writing and to allow kind of a number of concerns or things that interest me to build up and, and kind of percolate in a way. But it's often mixing those things that I've observed with things that I've read, things that have come from the literature that I'm reading. And also I do try and, so there is an element of trying to tap something that might be inside or at least might come from, you know, that kind of space of the unconscious, which I, I feel is totally informed by things from, you know, external things, but that, you know, kind of deals with the material that we, we observe and, and read in a strange way. Um, just by doing sort of writing exercises and writing without thinking, free writing and seeing what comes out and then ending up with a whole load of different disparate things, like some things I've no noted down in a notebook, some ideas from books that have interested me, some things I've written in writing exercises and then trying to kind of engage in a puzzle where I can piece those together into something something coherent. But it usually will be something, I've just recently finished a story which turned, which ended up being a kind of horror story about my local area but it sort of was sparked by a very strange photography studio around the corner for me which doesn't ever have any custom I, I don't know why I think it must you know it's it's you know it's very old it's maybe a front for something I'm not sure what I think that's probably unlikely it's just you know kind of somebody's had it for years and they don't do it but they there was some weird thing where there was a either was a joke or maybe a warning or something. Someone put in the window of this photography studio a picture, a, a small photograph of a baby. And <laughs> they'd, they'd like scratched teeth, like really sharp teeth, using a point of a knife or something. They'd scratch teeth into the sort of open mouth of this baby, which is crying and red faced, and then put it right in the middle of this display, which normally has like photos of graduations from the 1980s. All the normal photos have gone and just this. And I thought, you know, that's, that is genuinely terrifying. I've got to write it. <laughs> and how am I going to do it? So, so that was the, the sort of starting point. And then I kept just observing other things about, you know, totally unrelated things, but then making them kind of come together into a, into a story. So it generally is from the outside, I would say. And it's the actual narrative comes from the work of trying to put together disparate things that don't necessarily go together, but trying to put them together. Would you say it's difficult to find a publisher in the general of weird fiction? It's actually, I mean, it's a burgeoning field. It's really, you know, it's really growing. There's been a kind of renaissance of weird fiction, mostly in the US and Canada, but also a number of really great new weird fiction writers in the UK as well. It is still mostly in the small presses and most, most weird fiction, especially the kind of quite decadent sort of weird fiction, that moves away from the core sort of uh, Lovecraftian stuff oh, is still going to be in the margins. But there has been increasing interest. And last year there was um, a trilogy of novellas by Jeff Vandermeer, who I mentioned earlier, that did extremely well. And they're being made into to Hollywood films, I believe, at the moment. So the genre is kind of coming overground, um, having been having been a kind of underground thing for a long time. I mean, I think I gather that in the 80s, the only way you could get hold of books by virtually everyone apart from H.P. Lovecraft, who is a little bit better known, was to, um, you know, to, to kind of scour through secondhand bookshops. So it is, it is a burgeoning field. Yeah, I think sort of horror was killed by that huge boom in horror in the 80s where it was like the biggest literary genre and then suddenly it all collapsed in the early 90s. But uh, strange horror is definitely coming back, and so yeah, so it's still it's still niche at the moment. But there is that kind of there are books that that go out a bit more into the mainstream. So something that intrigued me is at the back of your first novel, The Wanderer, it said that it can be an account rather than a story. What did you mean by that? That's actually it's kind of 
it's a quotation. So it's a quotation from a, a classic kind of early 20th century weird fiction novel by um, a writer called uh, William Hope Hodgson, The House on the Borderland. And that was another book that was important to me in terms of the structure of a found manuscript. And it starts off with a, a preface supposedly by William, well, by William Hope Hodgson, but about this manuscript that's been given to him. And he says that as he reads it, he gets this uncanny sense that it might be more account than story. So I kind of lifted that idea because I think it's, it's a great notion. So yeah, so it's just that thing of suggesting that this might be a real artifact that you're holding in your hands, not a, not a work of fiction, not explicitly a novel, but something that is, is a genuine found manuscript, a found text, and, and that kind of uncanniness that comes with that. Fantastic. So do you have, did you have any specific reader in mind when you were writing your first novel? Not really. I think it, it did come from me wanting to try and assimilate influences and also to try and, you know, produce this, this work of fiction that did a variety of different things that I wanted to do. So in a way it was, it was more in a way an experiment, partly also because uh, the first draft of it was written as a as a the creative element of a PhD thesis. So there was definitely an element of this is a kind of experiment in fiction that I want to I want to kind of try out a few different principles and a few different forms and and play around with them. So as, in a sense, the only really expected or kind of reader that I that I wanted to kind of please was was an examiner, really a PhD examiner. So that was a kind of first thing. But when I was revising it, yeah, I guess I always had I always had in mind the idea of someone who was receptive to that kind of the bizarreness of the weird, and also someone who was kind of liked the idea of metafictional devices and and was in because the book sort of alludes to a number of different. Uh, writers and a number of different stories throughout so I wanted it to be a kind of to, to be a conversation with some of those other texts and to appeal to someone who who, who liked those kind of literary kind of devices um, as opposed to a reader who really likes to be immersed in their fiction because I always like the idea of throwing the reader out and um, rather than having a reader who is reading and totally absorbed in the story and kind of believing the story um, I like to the idea of putting in bits where the reader suddenly goes, okay, I, I'm really aware that I'm reading an artifact made of language here because this is, you know, thrown me out of this engagement. So some readers don't like that. So I guess that I was, you know, hoping to to appeal to that kind of reader and, and knew that I probably wasn't going to appeal to a reader who, who likes their kind of immersive text. So talking about being taken out of the text and the, the conversation going on, um, in your blog, Treaties on Dust, um, I noticed that your some of what you're writing seems to complement your first novels. Would you say um, that the characters live outside of your novel as well in other parts of your writing? Yeah, definitely. I not not so much in a sense of. I mean, I don't plan to write a series of of books, you know, dealing with with similar circumstances, different uh, um, or the same characters. But I do like the idea of repeated. Uh, events and repeated characters across across the a variety of works that I'm that I'm working on. So, when I read writers who have those kind of refer, you know references to other narratives of theirs or different events portrayed from different perspectives, there's that kind of sense again of this lives off the page that this maybe has an independent life. Uh, this isn't just a story that these these disparate accounts of the same event somehow kind of corroborate each other and give you that kind of horrible sense that maybe there's something, you know, genuine lying beneath that, you know. It's the way that, um, that you know, the early, that thing in the early 20th century of comparative mythology, you know, that was a really big thing, comparative folklore, things like um, phrases, the golden bough, where people were thinking that because you could find elements of the same folk tale in different parts of the world that that corroborated that it meant that they pointed to some genuine thing that had happened which is a you know kind of it, w it was a real fad and it's obviously died down because we know that narratives don't work necessarily like that and that maybe people were telling the same stories because they were articulating something about culture that's maybe the same across cultures but there is that sense i like that sense of um 
there's a contemporary American weird fiction writer called Laird Barron, who um, has written a couple of novels, but mostly writes short fiction. And he will um, have kind of like really small allusions to characters from other short stories of his popping up. And these kind of share this sense of a shared world gives you this real un- uneasy feeling when you're reading it that that maybe uh, that maybe he's just narrating something that's actually happened. So that's that's kind of the reason why I do that, and that's kind of why it appeals to me as a kind of device. So would you say like having a blog is helping you to promote your writing? A little bit. I think it's quite hard to. I'm not particularly good at blogging. I think if you if you can really be a regular blogger and get a good platform, I think it's a fantastic way to get your work out there. But it is a lot of work, and um, I have had some readers come to three, me through my blog and and read my novel as a result of reading uh, stuff on my blog. But I think that's probably less than the readers I found through more conventional ways of you know kind of reviews on, on on websites and things like that but I think having a blog and at one point I kept it up quite you know quite a lot and it the, that kind of routine of productivity even if it didn't help me kind of gain an audience really helped me as a writer kind of made me produce um, work on a regular basis and and know that uh, you know kind of refine it for a kind of publication and I love reading other writers' blogs. I think there's some fantastic stuff. There's a, a writer called M. John Harrison um, whose whose blog is is absolutely incredible. So it's, it's a source. It's a fascinating source for uh, material about writing and those kinds of things. And it's kind of where he he kind of expresses his his own kind of poetics about writing through these really kind of beautiful blog posts and notebook entries that he posts up there. So. I think writers' blogs are, you know, they they replace the kind of the journal or the or the you know kind of handwritten correspondence as a as a place where interesting kind of material about the writer's processes appears there. So so yeah, blogging is something I definitely like to get back to, um, and it is time consuming, but um, yeah, I think it's great, and I think it's great that there is that resource, and um, the internet becomes more and more fascinating I think all the time that you know and writing writing really thrives on the internet I think it, you know as as there's been a slowdown actually maybe less now but you know a slight slowdown in, in kind of the way that print media is getting out there there's been this kind of rise of the internet um, and the you know offers loads of fantastic possibilities to writers I think. So you mentioned earlier about doing a, a PhD um, with some creative writing, and um, we know that you're a, a lecturer at the University of Bedfordshire. Uh, so not to put you on the spot, but you must believe that the craft of writing can be taught. I do, yeah. I think it's a, I think there are a number of different sort of elements to that. There is a nuts and bolts, and I think anyone that denies this is... is uh, either extremely elitist or, or they're kind of deluded about their own process because they've learned their process in a different way. But there are there is a nuts and bolts to writing that um, that can definitely be learnt. The different forms have, you know, different demands. And, you know, I think it's yeah, it's important to teach, you know, kind of teach things like the short, you know, short story, the novel, and and to understand that they have different kinds of of structural demands but yeah things like exposing students to different formal conventions um, is probably the best way to get them to break the mold and experiment you can't you can't move forward without having a kind of a basic understanding of a variety of different conventions so so I think that's one way it can be taught so there is you know that kind of for example looking at the structure of a short story and you know spending time in class discussing that thinking about ways in which you can begin and end things um, and looking at the kind of conventional ways of doing that and then exploring ways that you could break the convention or do something different is actually a really good way to innovate. And I, I know one of the arguments against teaching creative writing is that somehow innovation comes from the sort of the, you know, kind of the mind that's just free to explore on its own. But I think that you can you can inculcate that kind of exploratory kind of way of thinking through teaching on a on a slightly side note I think there's an element um there's an element in which certainly at university level one of the things that's desirable in in all subjects in terms of teaching is for the students to be able to develop the learning themselves 
that not for lecturers to stand in front of the class and impart information and um, you know kind of engage in that kind of rote learning but to give students the tools to kind of work and develop um, their techniques for themselves and I think that's true of all subjects and I think creative writing is a subject where that kind of pedagogy is particularly there so I, but can it be taught the I mean the other thing that people often talk about is whether or not the ideas and that kind of you know the intangible stuff can be taught and I think that is trickier but I firmly believe that there's no such thing as um, someone who who has an innate ability to be a writer I think writing comes from reading writing comes from exploring and, and practicing so there are certain ways in which someone's external life will impact on them as a writer but you can also I believe teach and um, teach students to observe the world around them I don't think they need that people need to necessarily have a particular attitude to life or to have a particularly exciting experience of life to produce like really transgressive and interesting fiction so so I think all aspects can be taught you can teach the nuts and bolts of the craft but you can also teach that kind of attentiveness to the world that is mm -hmm. a key part of developing as a writer just to finish now what's going to be your next project is it going to be related to the universe you have already created in your first novel the wonder or i'm going to do something that has a few kind of key elements that recur but it's going to be really quite different i want to continue i mean i really like this notion of the found manuscripts so i'm going to pursue that And I'm also, again, going to be looking at London as a kind of weird space. Mm. That, that really appeals to me. Um, but other than that, it's going to be quite different. And it will have less of a kind of, um, there's a kind of adventure romance narrative that runs through The Wanderer. And the project I'm working on at the moment will have, uh, it will be much, much more dour and um, sombre in a way. Mm. Um It's going to be set in a similar kind of a similar kind of space, but it will be quite a different book. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. It's been fantastic getting to know about weird fiction. It sounds like it's a, a real emerging genre, mm. and I'm sure we'll hear an increasing amount from you in the future. So best of luck with your next novel, and I look forward to, to buying it. Okay. <laughs> thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, thank you. And now Tim's going to read some of his work for us. Okay, so the section I'm going to read is right from the opening of my novel, The Wanderer. And it it's, comes from the beginning of the strange sort of found manuscript that makes up most of my novel. The narrator of this found manuscript, who is an immortal on a dying earth in a far-flung future, is telling of his decision to write a memoir of his strange and unnaturally extended life, much of which has passed in being hunted by a dark adversary. So I'm just going to start, so it's right from the beginning. Dusk is gathering, but the grey canopy overhead is breaking up, and I hope to be able to begin my labours by the light of the moon that's soon to rise. I'm sitting on the deck of a rusting hulk I've made my home. A cargo freighter, named many ages ago, exactly why or by whom I cannot guess at. The Ark, that long since wrecked or scuttled, now moulders, canted, keel buried in the silt flats of a broad estuary, the mouth of a river known in earlier times as the Thames. I turn to look west. In the past few years, the skies have been rife with baleful hues. Tonight, the sunset is violet and vile. Silhouetted stark against it is the picked carcass of a vast city. Its colossal edifices, sun-bleached, time-worn, scoured by dust gyres, see monstrous tide rack or the strewed bones of a race of giants. The light of civilization has long since departed that place. It was once known as London, a name whose origins are lost to the royal past, a name not merely said but incanted, a word from a black rite, a name that must still haunt the dreams of the degenerate local tribes. Before rootlessness was forced upon me, it was my home. In the midst of its ruins, I found, preserved in a glass case, in what appeared to be a museum of antique curiosities, the typewriter on which I'm producing this account. When I recognised the letters on its keys, I was overjoyed. My native tongue hasn't been spoken for millennia, has long been dead and forgotten. Pondering this, I realise I'm not sure for whom I write, perhaps only for myself. 
save the demon who stalks me, I doubt there is another living who could make sense of these words. Still, I will write as if there were, to admit there's no one left able to read this account, aside from that devil and myself, would make the needful exertions unendurable. So, since I feel sore swollen, gravid with the spawn that is my tail, I'll pretend. I'll address you often and cordially, my reader, less to ingratiate my pitiful efforts than to evoke you by incantation. I'd also beg tolerance of my lack of facility for my ungainly prose. I haven't written for an age and must grope my way. My harried and woeful immortality began millennia ago, when I was but 29 years old. Since then, I've travelled the world over. But, as the earth, which has completed countless circuits of the sun since the things I wish to tell of occurred, always returns to the taste it set out from, my wanderings, despite imponderable distances travelled, have brought me back again to the scene of the events I mean to recount. Though I know it will be a tiresome, enervating task, I've decided to embark on the composition of this memoir now because I've become convinced in recent years history is drawing to a close. The tainted ether, the weird colours in the sky, is just one of a number of harbingers of the world's demise. And though I know I placed myself in danger, it felt only meet to return here to London to set down my tail. Besides, it's my birthplace, and it has been crying out to me, calling me home. You have been listening to The Writing Live. Now we want to thank Teresa, our editor, and Yvonne, the creator of the show.